Um, and then there'll be some supplemental information as well. But this is our uh, second deal we've done with uh, FTW in this uh, thesis. So this is Neighborhood Retail Portfolio 2. And we've actually already closed on the first of the two properties. And we've got just um, kind of a, a few spots left to fill out the, the final piece of this raise. And uh, excited to share it with you all. So let's kind of jump in. Uh, first, obviously, the, the disclaimers um, we need to, to share here. This is, you know, not an offer or solicitation to buy or sell security. Um, you need to review our full PPM to understand all the risks associated with this and all the terms uh, therein. And, you know, any representation of performance or projections need to be uh, understood as that um, and not, not any guarantee of performance. And, you know, please uh, review any forward-looking statements um, uh, and do your own due diligence. So, with that, I'm going to jump in. Uh, some of you may know our name, Aspen Funds. We've been a preferred partner with LFI for a long period of time. Our two co-founders, Bob Frazier and James Mafuccio, started Aspen about 10 years ago, uh, really with uh, finding unique opportunities in uh, you know, predominantly the real estate um, uh, space and started the first funds 10 years ago uh, after the great financial crisis in distressed debt. Um, and it's a very good time to get into that business. And we still operate that, that business line. A lot of you probably invest in our income fund. Um, and, uh, you know, a few years ago, we started um, you know, using our same approach of using this kind of macro uh, economic driven investment thesis to identify other opportunities um, that uh, we believe are going to be well supported by the economic trends going on. And so we started doing this and, uh, you know, partnering with really good operators. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. And um, this is our, our actually uh, uh, third deal we're doing with FTW. Um, the other part of our management team and partnership team is Dan Schulte. Um, he's our chief operating officer. And then myself, I'm our chief investment officer. Um, and, uh, you know, not to belabor all the backgrounds here, but, um, you know, my background was as a former banker and an underwriter and uh, joined Aspen five years ago and helped with all the capital markets. And then Parker, I'm going to have him just share real quickly on, on him, his background um, and his team's background. Obviously, there's a lot of relevance um, with Parker's background is, uh, related to this deal. So, Parker, you want to jump in there? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Ben. And thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Uh, so, FTW is comprised of the three original founders, which is Logan Freeman, Corey Tuck, and myself. Uh, we came together about five years ago to start partnering on opportunities uh, across uh, property types um, specifically, I came from a brokerage background. I've done everything from brokerage, um, property management, construction management, development, um, and with a, a real emphasis on on sh neighborhood centers. Uh, you know, previously worked for a group called Midwest Retail Properties, who's now one of the, if not the largest owner of Walmart shadow anchored shopping centers uh, in the country. Uh, so lots of background and emphasis in this area. We also have extensive background in, in other property types as well. Awesome. And just from an Aspen standpoint, the way I, I mentioned, we, we view our opportunities and we, we create our thesis for deals. If you're first looking at, at the top down macro trends, we believe will be in play and likely to continue. We like to look at trends that we believe are going to be well supported for a long period of time. We want to identify best asset classes that are going to uh, be supported by those trends and the strategies within those asset classes that will be um, uh, benefit from those. And then we, we partner and, um, you know, uh, do deals with uh, best-in-class operators. We perform extensive due diligence. We oversee asset management. And then our partners, we invest alongside um, all of our uh, investors in every deal that we do. And so we've already uh, put our, our capital in this deal and um, very excited about this one. So excited to jump in. I'm going to kind of skip some of this. Uh, this is kind of just some of our our macro trends that we are identifying right now. Uh, retail is a sector that we're very um, excited about. And uh, just a little bit on Aspen, if you don't know, we have a 10-year track record. Um, we actually have about $120 million of equity that we manage for investors, pretty much all retail investors, invested in all 50 states, um, 100 years of combined real estate experience, around the, been on the Inc. 5000 for the past five years, uh, for uh, council. And uh, here's some of the asset classes that we have invested in, you know, mortgage notes, kind of our uh, genesis in uh, 10 years ago, a lot of multifamily and storage all across the uh, risk spectrum from a class A, B, and C, about 3,000 units. We love industrial and retail, about 400,000 square feet we manage there. We've also done some non-real uh, estate as well. Um, if you 
have not, if you're a podcast listener, I know uh, LFI is an amazing podcast and we actually had Jim on uh, one of our earlier podcast episodes, but um, we take a very similar approach and you know, talk a lot about just uh, trends and in investing. This is really geared towards limited partner investors, passive investors, um, and how to become a better investor and find good opportunities. Um, you can check it out if you like. All right, let's jump in and uh, excited to, to keep going here. So the, the big idea and you know, why, why are we talking about retail, right? Retail get, gets a bad rap, you know, retail is dead. Amazon is the, the big retail killer. Um, and these are all the, the headline, you know, that we've heard for many years. And we actually love that uh, because the, 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 the headlines and the, the meta narrative has created um, uh, a lack of, of, of interest from a lot of types of investors on these types of properties when the fundamentals are, are saying something completely different. So one of the challenges is retail gets lumped all into one category, when in reality, there's about four or five distinct sectors within retail real estate, and they're all performing very differently. And so our thesis is that these, these neighborhood retail strip centers are going to be one of the best outperformers, um, uh, not just within retail, but within real estate um, uh, going forward. So the, these retail strip centers, they're generally you know, 20 to 50,000 uh, square foot strip centers, sometimes a little bit bigger. Um, but what we love about these is generally they have service-based businesses as tenants. And so why does that matter, right? Well, service-based businesses are very difficult to replace through e-commerce. So it has a low e-commerce threat. You think about, you know, your dog groomer, you know, your liquor stores, you know, the restaurants, the, you know, cell phone um uh, providers, uh, all your kind of professional services. So, you know, tax services and all these different types of businesses that require, you know, kind of a, an in-person presence and um, are not going to be replaced through e-commerce. You can't go get your haircut online, right? And what we're finding is we'll drill into the data here shortly, but the highest rent growth of all of the retail um, uh, sectors has been these neighborhood uh, strip centers. And the reason is there's not a lot being constructed so there's a lack of supply and there's been a massive amount of demand. We're actually seeing, if you look at kind of the big headlines, a lot of even big, big retailers that are big on the online space are actually um, uh, opening more stores, uh, physical brick and mortar stores. And so this kind of sweet spot that they're starting to discover is really a hybrid model, not just e-commerce, because e-commerce is great for a lot of types of products. But ultimately, there, there needs to be a brick and mortar component, which we're seeing a lot of retailers do. And so one of the things is coming back to kind of investing 101, right? Warren Buffett always has some great quotes. Be fearful when others are greedy and greedy when others are fearful. You know, what the wise do at the beginning, fools do at the end. And, and the idea is to have a contrarian approach, right, with, with what you are investing in. And when the meta narrative is saying one thing, but the, the fundamental data is saying something different, that creates really uh, amazing opportunity. And that's what we're really excited about this because we're going to show you some data that you're probably going to be a little shocked by when you see it. Real quick, before we dive into the data, we always love to give a quick summary of why do we like this deal? Here's, you know, if you don't hear anything else on, on the presentation, you know, pay attention to these two slides. The, 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 the first and foremost is a, a really great basis on these, these properties. And again, this is two properties that we're buying in a portfolio. Um, we've already closed in the first one. And our blended year one cap rate. So year one cash flow is at an 8.64% uh, cap rate. And I'm going to talk about cap rate in a minute and why that matters. But it's significantly discounted relative to other um, asset classes. And so we got we have cash flow day one. We're not paying that much for that cash flow. And uh, we believe there's actually substantial um, upside from that cash flow, which we'll talk about. One of the amazing things about this deal is it has cash flow, right? If you've been investing in multifamily recently, um, that's something you haven't seen for a while, at least in year one. And so um, this is something that is uh, where we love about these deals. These, these, these cash flow very well. Um, we are expecting stabilized cash on cash returns net to investors to be between seven and 9%. And when you're investing in cash flow in properties, that is the number one way to reduce your risk, right? And especially in a, in a potential recession, um, and you know, what's the one way you reduce your risk is you have the ability to hold through a recession and you have to have cash flow to do that. Um, we, we, we love the dynamics of this industry, especially these neighborhood centers, because there's very minimal institutional ownership of this asset class. 
And so there's a lot of market inefficiencies to, to, to capitalize on this uh, industry as, as it is consolidating. And mom and pop owners are generally not uh, great operators. They don't know how to structure these leases right. And right, that's where Parker and his team and his background really make these, these properties um, uh, add in a ton of value because it's, it's predominantly lease structuring um, and how you create the value, which is uh, not a whole lot of, of uh, risk. Um, great sponsorship team, like I've talked about backgrounds here. Um, great, great tax benefits. We're expecting kind of a 50 to 60% year one write-off that will be in 2023. Um, we have great uh, conservative debt terms. We've got five-year fixed rates. These are uh, more regional lenders we're working with that um, are locking the rate for five years. And these are recourse loans. So the sponsorship team is signing you know, personal guarantees on, on these loans, aside from just the co-investment, we have a lot of skin in the game on, this, on these deals. And then the last thing, I always love to throw a chart like this in there, right? This is kind of the risk uh, adjusted return spectrum, right? So when you're looking at a deal, you need to look at what are the returns I'm projecting to get relative to the risk that I'm taking, right? And some of the you know, more common uh, types of, of deals that you'll see um, are going to be a core, which are kind of your um, you know, uh, prime location, prime asset, stabilized asset, and kind of your big uh, primary markets. You have your core plus, which are uh, you know more stabilized properties, um, maybe not in the in the, the, the core markets. Uh, maybe there's a little bit of upside, uh, but it's not really a value add, right? It's um, you can uh, already come largely stabilized. Then you have your value add, which are going to require a, a general, generally a larger capex program to implement to generate the higher value adds. If you're opportunistic in development and stress, we we view this deal as is kind of in the in the core plus. Um, range. And the reason is because both of these properties right now are 100% leased. They're in very, very strong submarkets here in Kansas City. And there's actually very minimal capex needed to achieve our business plan. Most of the value we're going to create, which we'll talk about here in a little bit, will be taking these leases that are way under market, and they're generally gross leases, to market rate triple net leases. And um, uh, just literally restructuring the leases is going to be uh, one way that we add a lot of value here. So that's, that's why we view this as a, as a pretty um, very strong risk adjuster return opportunity. Um, like Eric mentioned, we have a $50,000 minimum. We are waiving that for LFI members. Um, if you guys can hit our 250 minimum on our better share class, projecting a five-year hold period, we have an 8% preferred return. We're targeting a 15 to 20% annualized return. Um, 14 to 17% net IRR. And then the real sweet thing is our net cash flow numbers, which uh, we think are going to be high single digits. It's possible we could hit low double digits on these deals if we um, uh, can achieve the business plan and uh, keep the vacancy very, very low. Um, we have our two kind of waterfalls here, very simple, but it's uh, our, our class A2, which you guys would be coming in at, is going to be the um, better economics. So we're going to have, uh, you get the better split from a 80, 30, 80, 20 split uh, to a 75, 25 split. Um, no, sorry, you're at the A1 <laughs> reverse. You get the better, better split to the LP. So 80, 80, 20 versus 75, 25. All right, let's jump into the market. So this is, this is the, 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 the macro picture. We always like to look at what are the big trends going on? I'm going to fly through some of this because uh, we've done a lot of supplementary uh, webinars. We actually did a podcast interview with, with Parker um, a few weeks ago that talked a lot about this stuff. So I'm going to kind of fly through this um, and then we're going to get to the specific opportunity. Um, first is retail apocalypse. Is it still happening? Well, it's it's pretty much mostly happened. We, we do believe there's going to be continued e-commerce penetration and an increase of overall retail sales um, in e-commerce increasing, but at a much slower rate. So what we're seeing is a flattening of e-commerce. And if you look at the last 10 years, uh, when you're looking at the, the, the decrease in vacancy over the last 10 years, the, the biggest driver of that decrease is neighborhood centers. And that's uh, pretty apparent by that chart. And then what we're seeing on, on other data as well. Um, so we've already kind of gone over this, but but really, you know, we're, we're seeing these massive inefficiencies from lack of institutional ownership. It's an overlooked asset class. Um, uh, because it has been had minimal ownership and uh, the kind of meta narrative of retail is dead. Um, meanwhile, obviously the un underlying fundamental data is very, very uh, strong. Um, 
And, you know, it's, it's uh, difficult to know how to you know, operate these, right? It's to, to really maximize the opportunity here. You have to understand how to structure leases. You have to know what it takes to attract good tenants um, and, uh, you know, working with having deep relationships with, with brokers in the markets. It's, it takes a lot to operate these well. And then we're also seeing, you know, a flight to the suburbs. So as, you know, more uh, uh, the demographics move to suburbs, um, that's going to provide more opportunities for demand um, from customers for these uh, properties. Um, and here's the different ways you can add value. I'm not going to go through all this. Uh, ultimately, you know, the th these properties, again, are 100% leased. The, the primary way we're going to be driving value, and we're going to get into the specific properties here in a sec, is by bringing these rents to the, the fair market value, going from, from gross leases you know, to, to triple net leases and marking them uh, to market at a much higher uh, lease rate. That is the market. And uh, also providing you know, tenant improvements that are going to allow uh, you know, better quality tenants to come in. You know, the, both these, these properties are in Kansas City. Uh, both myself and Parker are from Kansas City. We, we know this market very, very well. It's a very, very strong city, very well diversified. Um, and uh, I know a lot of you have invested in our Iron Horse deal. And that's, you know, in a, a tertiary market outside of, of Kansas City here. But we know this market. There's a lot of reasons to like this market. And I'm going to get into the specific submarkets um, here in a sec that these properties are in. But we're seeing um, Kansas City is, is in one of the, one of the top um, markets for, for rent growth in this, uh, in retail. So there's been a lot of demand here for retailers to come to Kansas city, the business plan. So, uh, Parker, I'm going to kind of turn it over to you to kind of, uh, jump into some of these, uh, slides here and, and give us the real meat here of what we're going to do to execute on the opportunity here in these, these properties. Yeah, so here's an example of another property that is actually already within our portfolio. Um, this is Grandview Gateway Shopping Center in Grandview, Missouri. Uh, it's a submarket south of um, Kansas City. Um, this is a kind of tire distress center. Um, the prior ownership group had, you know, lost some tenants and wasn't really cutting deals, uh, wasn't willing to invest in any capital improvements, uh, and let the center sort of distress over time. And what we saw over time in that center is that the rental rate started to decline, bad deals started getting cut. Deals started getting structured as gross leases, which then means we're not collecting the additional revenues for taxes, insurance, and common area maintenance. And so this property was sitting, you know, adjacent to a very, a very large uh, full-scale redevelopment. And we deemed it a good opportunity to go in here and redevelop this particular property to attract um, both new tenants and as well as additional shoppers uh, to the site so that we can add value to those tenants. The number one way that we add value to these tenants, right, is that we bring them more sales. And so by giving this property a refresh, you know, facelift, updating sign bands, glass, monuments, concrete, asphalt, landscaping, et cetera. Um, we were able to bring on not only additional tenants, we've been able to increase rental rates from an average of about eight bucks a foot on various forms of gross leases in place to about 13 bucks a foot today. And we're pushing those rental rates on this project today to 15 to 20 bucks a foot on new leases. Yeah, it's it's pretty amazing. We're involved in this project as well, and one of the one of the cool things about this, right, on this particular property, you know, there's some little deferred maintenance. You had to update the parking lot, but the the cool thing is a lot of it is aesthetics, right? Because if you can make these appealing uh, to the consumers, where they they look nice, they look safe, they want to come, you know, drive into this little strip center, it is going to drive more traffic, which then you know, it's going to drive more sales to the tenants, which is then going to attract better tenants. So it's this kind of virtuous cycle that doesn't really require a lot, just a you know, simple aesthetic facelift can do wonders, right? And uh, so this is you know, a great example of what we're going to be implementing uh, on these particular projects. So this is our, our first <coughs> property. We've actually already closed on this one. Um, Park, you want to talk about, you know, obviously the submarket is one of the best submarkets in Kansas City, um, but this particular property is actually 100% leased right now, right? And it's cash flowing at a pretty good, pretty good uh, uh, cap rate. We've actually modeled in our underwriting. I believe it's a 7.5% uh, vacancy, um, even though we are at uh, right now 100%. Um, so we're trying to be conservative. Um, and as we push rents, we're expecting, you know, some vacancy there. But talk about this, this particular uh, property in our portfolio and why we're so excited about it. Yeah, so Mission is uh, one of the hottest areas in, in Kansas City. We've just seen some substantial development happening here. It's great school districts in this corridor. Uh, this, it's debatably the best or the second best school district in all of Kansas City. 
Uh, and so we just have just seen, you know, substantial amount of residential development, commercial development. Uh, adjacent to this, there's been both of those as well as some senior housing development. And really this entire corridor, which is sort of the old school um, kind of town, you know, main street type for the city of Mission, uh, this whole corridor has been completely, you know, uh, beautified by the city. And so they did a lot of work on the the roads, the streets, the landscaping, and we've just seen such a resurgence here. Uh, so there's a few large projects that are still happening adjacent to this, and we've acquired this entire city block there, as well as about a quarter of the adjacent east block. Um, and so here's, you know, some of those developments that we're talking about. So the locale, 201 unit Class A development, Mission Gateway, this is a project that's been kind of long in the works. They're, they're talking back to um, uh, with the city right now to renegotiate their their TIF agreement, but this is a large project, you know, 400,000 plus square feet of mixed use, uh, really exciting project for the area. And the Mission Bowl Apartments of Sunflower Development, a group that we have good relationship with, it's a, a really uh, prolific developer here in Kansas City is doing 176 unit apartment building at the former Mission Bowl site. So just again, this property already sat adjacent to a lot of rooftops. And when it comes to neighborhood centers, what we like are rooftops, right? We want to be close to the action. Uh, we want to be accessible and we want to be, you know, somewhere that people can get to on the way to work, on the way home from work uh, and be able to have a great experience when they're doing that. So we're seeing even more rooftops, you know, nearby us here, which is going to be great for the property. Absolutely. Here's some of the, the leases and the target rents here. Yeah, so one of the things about this is we're seeing, you know, lease comps here really in the mid to high teens and some even in the, the low 20s. Uh, we're underwriting for kind of mid teens lease structures and we're even taking some of the existing leases uh, and writing those down to lower lease rates in our model. So, you know, assuming that some of the larger spaces might be, you know, set above market and so we're assuming that those are going to come down uh, a little bit. We're really targeting, you know, 12 to 14 foot for what we'd call the the secondary sites, so not the main Johnson Drive corridor, and then the Johnson Drive corridor really targeting that mid uh, teen square foot, uh, so 16, 17 bucks a foot triple net. Right. All right, let's talk about this other one. This is a, a, a great one. I love how you say it. We're, uh, we're basically getting the benefit of a grocery anchor without having to pay for it. So why we love this one. Yep. And that's exactly right. So this is a Tomahawk retail is a Walmart neighborhood shadow anchored property. And so what we love about that is that, like I mentioned before, we're in grocery anchored properties, you're paying for the credit and the traffic that are derived by grocery, but that is expensive. And so you end up paying a lot more per square foot for that property in order to get that. Well, this is a shadow anchored property. So we're not acquiring the Walmart neighborhood market. This is still adjacent to us though, and is going to drive traffic to our property uh, so that we can benefit from the traffic that Walmart's driving. So we effectively get the benefit of an anchor without having to pay for its credit. So I was going to say, you can see here, I mean, the deferred maintenance is pretty minimal. We're going to do, you know, a light facelift on a few things here, but th there's not a lot of capex needed. Um, and the real opportunity here is very similar to Mission, where it's really restructuring these th these leases. So a lot of these are the gross leases that we're going to be converting to triple net as well. Correct? That's absolutely right. So we're doing a lot of you know lease uh, conversions, and this is something that we've done across the board at, at a lot of our properties. And so we're very confident in our ability to do that. We're seeing you know mid teens. Uh, high teens, you know, triple net leases. And so we're going to be targeting those, those mid teen spaces. Uh, we have some, what we'll call office spaces that are, you know, lower, we're going to target a little bit lower rate, they're kind of what I call secondary spots within the center. And so we're going to target lower rates, we're underwriting the lower rates, although we believe that's conservative. And again, th this property is 100% leased, and we are underwriting to a seven and a half percent vacancy. So just again, trying to be conservative. Um, but again, it's, it's, there's very strong demand for both, both of these. And one thing I forgot to point out, but in the kind of top right here, you can see this little map we pulled from Google, but it's a, you know, six minute drive from another property we own in our other portfolio. Um, that is, uh, uh, great. So we can get some efficiencies just from management and, um, just construction, all that kind of stuff. All right. So again, hundred percent occupied, amazing locations, uh, great travel accounts because of those roofs close to the neighborhoods, a lot of developments going on nearby. Uh, the real opportunity here is converting these leases to triple net, uh, implementing professional leasing and management, and really starting to attract more regional national credit by structuring leases that are going to be appealing to them, right? And knowing how to do that is very, very important. Um, and uh, you can kind of see here, we have a very uh, wide variety <clears throat> of uh, tenant composition. So Park, you want to talk a little bit about you know, what we like about some of the uh, diversity here? 
Yeah, as you can see here, there's obviously a very diverse set of industries that are represented within these two properties. And I, I kind of put out there a little summary here as well. And if you actually total this up, the actual retail uh, exposure here in terms of what the retail tenancy is, is 18.8% of the properties. And so when we talk about how these neighborhood retail centers, yes, there's retail and retail is an important component of it. But they're not all retail. And a lot of this is, you know, food and beverage. These are restaurants. This is maybe a liquor store. It's places like that where you're going to go, you know, have a bite to eat, grab something on the way home. You know, services account for 44.8% of the total tenancy here. That's tax preparation. That's um, health chiropractic, et cetera, all those kinds of things. And health is actually about 3.9% of specific health. Um, and so then we have an event. It's 16.8% of the total. Uh, that event space is on mission. It's one of the most highly trafficked event spaces in Kansas City. It is 100% booked for the next year. And so we're really excited about that property as well, or about that, that tenant. Absolutely. All right. And so we've already kind of talked about uh, structures here. Uh, this was for our first closing. So uh, we've already done the first property. And one of the, the cool things about it is we're already closing the first property. But this is a portfolio. We have a kind of few spots left, like I mentioned, to kind of round out the final race here. And um, you get the benefit of bo both properties. And the cool thing is, so I forgot to put this in the, in the deck because um, we haven't updated it yet, but we just got an appraisal on our mission property. So that first property um, that we're talking about, and it came in uh, on an as-is basis at $350,000 uh, higher than we purchased it for. So that's actually honestly pretty rare to see, especially in this environment with appraisers. They're they're generally extremely conservative and uh, they actually knew we, what we bought it for. So generally they're going to appraise to that value, right? But they actually appraise it at $350,000 higher as is in current leases. And so again, just further substantiation that we know we're getting some really great value on these properties. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to pause here, open it up to some Q and a, we tried to fly through this. So apologies if some of that uh, felt a little bit brief, but we did want to keep a little bit of time for Q and a, um, and uh, open it up. All right. Uh, thanks guys for the presentation. Um, I had a little issue right in the middle there. So I saw there were some in the chat, but it dropped. Uh, so if you submitted a question before, uh, maybe resubmit that too. Uh, so if you, if you had a question out there, um, one question I had just to start is what, what do you guys have between the two properties? What do you guys uh, see as the uh, credit quality of the tenants too? Are there any that are concerning to you as you, as you look to, to move to a new lease structure or how do you feel about the stickiness of the uh, credit quality of the tenants? Yeah, I'll, I'll let Parker dive into that. You know, part of the reason we want to underwrite to a higher vacancy is we expect um, there's going to be some turnover as we're pushing pushing those uh, leases. And then the goal is we obviously want to attract um, additional regional and national credit. We already have some some pretty strong tenants um, in there, um, and then we want to continue to to increase that overall quality. But Parker, are there any in particular to his question that we are you know not planning on renewing or would would have a concern over going in? Yeah, so we have really a blend across the board here between the 50 or 49 tenants that we have in the in the two properties, a blend of what we'd call local, regional and national credit. Um, you know, what we like about that is that we have sort of a, a sampling, right? And so one, one thing that you, you think about when you have a shopping center that maybe say has all national credit is that sometimes it loses the life right, of that property. And what brought that property some uniqueness are these local businesses and these entrepreneurs who have been in a business, maybe 5, 10, 15, 20 years in the same location. Um, that's that's hugely important, I think. And as we've seen here in in Kansas City on the, the acquisition, and I'll, I'll speak poorly of a project only in, in terms of the uh, the life here, but the, the Country Club Plaza, which is the first auto-oriented shopping center built in the United States, built here in Kansas City. And it's a huge area for Kansas City. It's a great lifestyle center. But when it was acquired five, six years ago, um, a lot of the push there was to get incredibly high rents. And so in order to really get incredibly high rents, they pushed out a lot of the local and regional groups. And so what we think has happened there is that it lost a lot of the life, a lot of the things that were great, you know, going to the shoe shine shop that you like to go to, and then the local coffee shop and all of that, a lot of those people couldn't keep up with rents in the 40, 50 bucks a foot range. And so you lost some life. And so we like the idea of really having a combination of local, regional, and national. National obviously adds great credit. Generally speaking, they're longer-term leases. And the local and regional players are going to add what we think is life to the center. And so that, that tenant mix is very important to us. So 
that's sort of a long answer to say, yeah, there's some there's some folks in here that we expect as we as we push things through, uh, we're going to to lose some folks. But I think that that gives us even more of an opportunity to go out and find some additional folks who want to be in the centers. Uh, as we're driving more traffic, driving more sales of the properties, there are plenty of tenants that we have relationships with in this market that are going to see that value and want to be in the shopping center. I wouldn't expect it's a huge amount. And generally speaking, we push these things up over time. And a lot of these more local uh, credit tenants have shorter term leases that we can push shorter bits over time so that the the hurt of, say, the rental rate increase doesn't hit them all at once. I might add one more thing to that as well. We, we discussed on our podcast that we chatted about a few weeks ago, but, you know, during COVID, it was really interesting because a lot of the expectation was that, you know, the, the properties that had big national credit tenants were going to be in the best position. Um, but what ended up happening was actually the, the inverse, um, because what happened is uh, the national credit tenants, because they got, you know, they, they got 800 pound gorillas in the room, they decided they just weren't going to pay. And this, oh, we, you know, we have some cash flow issues, even though they're getting these massive PPP loans, right? <clears throat> and uh, they were not paying. So it was actually very difficult to collect the rents um, from these national credit tenants. Meanwhile, the, the, the local regional credit were the ones that kept paying. And mm -hmm. they realized the necessity of, of making it through. And, um, you know, the, the retailers that really soared were the ones that were able to adapt. And, you know, like the restaurants that are doing, you know, just takeout or, uh, you know, uh, delivery and, and, and things like that, where they were able to, to shift their business models and be creative. And they're the ones that actually um, kind of soared through and uh, continued to make payments. So it's kind of an interesting, you know, expectation uh, uh, mismatch on, on what happened during the most recent kind of recession. Great. Great. Thanks guys for uh, elaborating on that. Uh, don't see any questions in, in the chat yet. Uh, uh, Eric, if we still have you on, I know we had several dropped on late. Do you want to give a quick rundown again of the tribe vest portion of the commitment? Sure. Yes. Uh, my, Contact info is in there. Let me pull up my little. Um, all right. So we're going to open a tribe vest is opening a dedicated tribe for this investment. Um, and as Ben said, Aspen is covering the setup fee for this. So that's, that's awesome. Uh, uh, this is a single investment tribe. So this is the only investment it's going to make. Um, it's a $25,000 minimum uh, to invest through the tribe. Um, you have to be an accredited investor. Um, we need a minimum of 25, 250,000 in total commits uh, in order to form the, formalize the tribe and make the investment. TribeVest is going to run everything from start to finish, all the communication and everything. Um, I, I submitted the link um, in the chat, and it'll also come out in the webinar recording um, that you can make the, the commitment. It's a soft commit. Enter the information. That's all you have to do, and then I'll contact you directly. If you don't, if you don't understand TribeVest or want more information on how it actually works, um, you can text me, call me, uh, email me. It's totally fine. Happy to communicate. All right. Thanks, Eric. And would you mind posting those again? Those dropped from sure. my chat, so I don't know if they dropped from everybody's chat. Too, okay. So. Yeah. No problem. And then uh, Ben, do you want to talk about the commit? If they're not going through TribeVest, the direct commit process through you guys. Yeah, if you're not going to go through TribeVest first, you know, we would say if, if that is uh, appealing to you, uh, feel free to, to do that. Um, uh, it's just a little bit simpler, but we also will allow kind of outside investment directly into um, uh, uh, the project. And we will, you know, waive the uh, minimum investment from 50K uh, down to 25 and we'll offer the better uh, share class as long as we can hit that 250 in total. Um, so you can reach out directly to my team at investor relations at aspenfunds.us. Uh, also, if you have any other follow-up questions, be happy to chat through more specifics of those questions and we can send, you know, a, a, a full data room that we have with other podcast episodes, underwriting model on this deck as well, um, for those that are, that are interested. Great. Great. Well, you guys must've done a really good job of answering all the questions. I don't see anything else in the chat. Is there anything else you guys want to? add to uh to the story before we wrap up i will think so either a really good job or a really really bad job so you know hopefully it's it's the former it was a no, good job no you guys did a good job, you guys did a good job. job. oh um, hey uh, one just pop popped in right yeah uh mike is asking can you clarify the waterfall split yeah let me go back to that slide here
So we have a 8% preferred return on both. And then it's a simple after the 8% preferred return. Um, uh, there's a 75-25 LPGP split on our standard share class. And if you're investing through TribeVest or from the LFI uh, community, you get a 80-20 split uh, on your share class. So you get a, a 5% additional uh, of, the, of the carry, which I believe it equates to about a 10 to 15% boost on the overall return from what I'm showing here on that, that $50,000 $50, uh, investment. All right. And Mike, thanks for asking too. I, on the tribe vest form, it says 75, 25, but as long as we hit that 250 minimum, uh, then that bumps up to the, to the, uh, to the 8020. Yeah. So we definitely, yeah, good, good, good catch there, Mike. So it is 8020. So you I'll guys, you will get 80% of the, of the carry above that 8% preferred return. And I, I will say, you know, we do have a, a, a catch up provision, on um, the uh, uh, disposition waterfalls. So we have two waterfalls. We have a, a cash flow waterfall from operations. And then when we sell the property or refinance the property, there's a catch up provision. So it just brings um, the management team to pair of pursue to that 20% um, uh, you know, after you get that 8% preferred return and then it does the split. Um, but that's all reflected in these, return, these numbers here. And it's only on the disposition waterfall. So I just wanted to clarify that. You'll see that in the PPM, but um, that is the only difference in the waterfall uh, uh, than on the operations waterfall. All right, great. Uh, I think that's it for chat questions. Unless, unless anybody's got anything else or Eric, anything to add? No, I'm good. Thank you. All good. All right. Hey, thanks guys. We, we really appreciate your time. And uh, please, if anybody's watching or on the recording, reach out and uh, we'll get you connected. All right. Thanks, everybody. really appreciate it. And uh, great to see some of you on here and hope that you'll jump in with this uh, on this project. We're very excited about it and uh, and hope you will as well. All right. Thanks so much. Sounds good. Thanks, thanks everyone. Thanks, everyone.